Hi everyone. If I say the word Rio de Janeiro, does any word come into your mind? Carnaval, yes, of course, carnaval. Any other words? Yes, we have first uh, Christ the Redeemer as well and beaches, Copacabana. You've seen my slides before. So yes, these are the things that Rio is famous for. Uh, and I skipped all of that fun when I visited Rio in 2012 because I was stuck in UN negotiations for a global deal to make the world more sustainable. So whenever I think of Rio, I will always think of this, the Sustainable Development Goals. Now again, a question to you, who of you has heard of them before? Raise your hand. Yeah, most of you, that's good. For those who haven't, there are 17 goals. The whole world has agreed to achieve them and the deadline is 2030. But what few people know is something that I'd like to share with you today. The negotiations, they were stuck after two years of preparation and 10 days of intense debating. And a last minute closed door meeting was called for to hammer out a compromise. I was one of only 50 people who managed to get in that room. And that's because the brave little country of Belgium, the delegation leader had given full access passes to the whole of the delegation, also to non-governmental people like me. And so the meeting began with the Brazilian diplomat host sharing with the participants in the meeting room that he was sorry that he had circulated a quite totally new text yesterday evening at the last minute to try to hammer out a compromise, but that he felt that was needed to go home with something that would be this or nothing, basically. And we would have one day to change maybe a last little comma here and there. And the EU representative was quite angry about that. So he took the word, say, look, this is not how we do a UN negotiation process. We cannot consent to, to this process. And the Brazilian host just reiterated, we will go home without anything if we don't just go with this new text. And then he gave the floor to the Korean representative. And the Korean representative politely uttered that he was a bit surprised, but not entirely unhappy and he would uh, not object to the new text of the Brazilian host. And the EU guy again protested, steam was coming out of his ears. He was consulting with his advisor, should we just pack our bags and leave? But they stayed. And so we had the sustainable development goals. That became it. And I was like this little kitten that had somehow sneaked in the room through the cat door, sitting in a corner and observing something that I wasn't supposed to see. Um, and that made me think like, I started with saying Rio, the words that are coming out of Rio, if you think of Rio. And for those who are into alliterations, they all seem to start with a C. It's Carnival, it's Christus, Christ the Redeemer, or Copacabana. Well, why don't we add the word coup? Because the SDGs were in effect a diplomatic coup by an emerging, a confident emerging economy, Brazil, in support with other emerging economies. But that coup has kind of cruel consequences that very few people know about. Because in this new text, if you screen it, you will see 20 times the words economic growth. It doesn't contain any wording of the limits to that economic growth. And so world leaders agreed to a plan to save us all, uh, to, get, to, get, to get out of the mess that humanity finds itself in because of growth with eternal, without eternal uh, limits. And so uh, this made me think of a paradox. This is what economic growth actually looks like. It's economic growth, but also growth of fertilizer use, freshwater use, greenhouse gas emissions, international travel, and so forth. And it shows you the last 250 years. And there is a specific pattern here. At first, the growth of all these indicators was linear. And then this growth became exponential. And now, to go back to the C word alliteration fund, do you remember the corona curves? And how when things went bad, when they went from linearized to exponentialized? Because that's when things got really nasty. Well, things are getting pretty nasty because of these exponentially rising curves. And that's 
visible through ever more heat waves and floods and even food price inflation that we have today. So the scientists who've made this uh, great acceleration paper and installation are saying that given the size of our economy today, more economic growth actually does more harm than good. So whenever you hear, especially in high income regions like Europe, like this place, politicians asking us to believe in green growth, the science is not agreeing to that. They are saying green growth in Europe is an oxymoron. It's a contradiction. It's like me saying I'm a vegetarian carnivore. It doesn't really exist. In technical terms, economists say that the decoupling of economic growth from less environmental harm is a myth and they have debunked this decoupling myth. At the same time, these economists are saying in the good news that prosperity for all of us is possible without this devastating economic growth. So when we published uh, one report based on this emerging science, we chose to have a green growth unicorn at the top of a massive cliff of obstacles on the path to get to green growth. These are all the barriers, things like the rebound effect. And the scientists are pretty clear that, yeah, we can't get to this green growth unicorn. It's, it's a myth. And I would like to think that we can make policies based on data, on evidence. And if emotions are allowed into the policy making process, I'm hopeful that we can allow other emotions than fear of change of paradigm or ignorance. And maybe we can allow some love and some rage in the decision making. Why? Well, I feel love and rage. I feel love for the natural world because I've traveled a bit and I've seen the beauty in the world. There's so much beauty out there. And, and I feel rage because I see so much of the beauty is being destroyed by this economic growth paradigm that we live in. And I've met so many of the victims of this paradigm. I've gone away from this comfort zone, this bubble that we are here in, this privileged part of the world and travel to places where the economy rubs with the earth and with humanity, where conflicts are arising. In fact, there are thousands of environmental conflicts in the world. And I've worked together with scientists and activists and people all over the world for decades to create of environmental conflicts in the world. All these dots are places where people resist some economic activity that's damaging both the environment and their community, their livelihoods. To just take one example, the opening of yet another new lithium mine, which will then drain a whole region of its water, just so that some other people in another part of the world can drive their Teslas thinking that they are part of the green growth economy and doing good. Well, these front lines are, are not sustainable at all. We have to get beyond them. And when I was making this presentation, I was suddenly thinking of a certain um, Turkish old proverb. And the proverb goes like this. The forest was shrinking, but the trees kept voting for the axe. For the axe was clever and convinced the trees that because his handle was made of wood, he was one of them. And that's what happens in the world today as well. We are voting for people who are telling us green growth unicorn stories that make us feel good maybe. But actually the science knows that these green growth unicorns are chopping away the branch on which we all sit. Another metaphor I was thinking of when preparing this is the movie Don't Look Up. Who of you have seen it? Don't Look Up. A few of you have. Well, for those who haven't, long story short, there's a comet that's going to hit the earth and there are scientists trying to warn humanity of this big danger. But soon they find out that nobody wants to talk about the elephant in the room, the comet in the sky, or the conflicts caused by eternal growth. They are being ridiculized and they are being put away by politicians and a social media that are doing everything they can, often in their own self-interest, to not make you look up, but to make you look down, to not see what's really happening.
And I'm here to try to convince you to have the courage to take your head out of the sand. And once the sand is removed from your eyes, maybe you will be able to see that the beyond growth or post growth economy isn't that bad at all. It actually offers humanity a whole lot more security and stability for everyone than any little course correction on either capitalist growth or communist growth ever will. And I personally can also share with you, it feels quite liberating to let go of this dominant consensus reality paradigm that we need this growth. And I've gone on a long journey on this before I felt liberated from being close to that growth paradigm. It started 2010 when I visited the, one of the first degrowth conferences. These are economists, professors, PhD students, looking at how can an economy operate without depending on that growth. And we were just 150 people in Barcelona. A few years later in Leipzig in Germany, there was a conference similar to that, but it had 3000 people. The number of peer reviewed articles on post growth or degrowth kept rising. And my job has been to bring that academic debate within the European environmental movement. I work for the European Environment Bureau, it's a federation of the environmental NGOs. And when I arrived 10 years ago, nobody was working on beyond growth. We had some work on circular economy, yes. But now we have a team of six people working on only this post growth policies, practices, narratives, and how to unpack what scientists are uh, working on to a larger audience of policymakers. Um, so I'm, I've seen this debate grow. Now we have people, scientists working with models, the models on the left, not all those on the right, showing how a sustainable future is actually possible if we let go of the green growth paradigm. And I've also seen the debate grow within EU policymaking circles. So first you had this degrowth academic movement, then you've seen like the pickup in civil society, in movements, and now you see that EU decision makers are warming up to this topic. Just uh, five years ago, I was also a co-organizer of a conference in the European Parliament. We were eight members of the European Parliament. We had a few hundred people having two days of good debates on everything linked to this topic and Europe. And we had some media exposure in 20 countries in Europe on that. And then Corona came and everything came to a halt. But now in two weeks, in mid-May of this year, we have a repeat of this much bigger, the Beyond Growth Conference. 20 members of the European Parliament from all the political parties, the whole top of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, Charles Michel, 2000 participants, 50 NGOs. We will be debating for three days, three days, all the different ways, the policies in Europe that we have, how can we make them beyond growth proof? And the newest group of people that's joining this debate is the CEOs, the big businesses, because they are also looking up. Some of them, pioneering CEOs, have their heads out of the sand. They are looking up. They see what's coming. I'm organizing in this conference a panel debate with Kate Raworth from the Donut Economy, but also with a CEO of a big multinational company in the circular economy who wants to engage with us on this topic. Just a few months ago, I was asked to speak for 100 chief um, finance officers of big companies in Belgium who also invited me to tell them, well, how can businesses even operate and thrive if the economy doesn't grow? Well, there are pioneers showing what is possible. You have a cooperative doing electric car sharing, allowing car users to have the function of car driving without the need to buy new cars. And they make probably a smaller GDP across the domestic product because you don't need to make that many cars anymore. But they are offering the service, it works. And I'm also starting a cooperative myself because I want to also practice what I preach. Uh, so with a few friends in Leuven, we are looking at how to create a cooperative that changes the way we do business here in Leuven. And the first ingredient that we had is imagination. We need to think of this other economy first, how it could work. So I'm gonna share a little bit of my Im Im imagination with you. You can see a whole fleet of cargo bikes crisscrossing the streets of Leuven in far better ways, delivering goods to local businesses than the exploited and exhausted van driver delivering goods, blocking the pavement, polluting the air, 
while the profit goes to some multinational company. We see how this can create local value, local jobs, and how it can restore the broken bond between nearby farmlands and citizens and uh, shops and businesses here in Leuven. And I believe what Naomi Klein has told me, I, I worked with her in the past, is no is not enough. We need the yeses too. And this is for me one of the yeses. To wrap up, I think it's time that we move beyond the prairies on which the green growth unicorns roam. It's time to embrace the truth that growth is the big error on the path to sustainability. And it's time to recognize that the beyond growth economy is not only something that we need, it's not so that it's just possible, it is actually a positive story. It is liberating to be part of it. It is already happening. It is in this country and it is in this city. So I'm here to basically invite you to, to be part of this future because it offers the two things that we all need now in a world full of geopolitical and geophysical crisis. We need more resilience and we need regeneration. And I hope you will join me on this journey. Thank you.